this video, we're going to talk about poverty, how we define it, how it's measured, and some problems with how poverty is measured. And then we'll go on to talk about a few ways that we might be able to try to alleviate some of the problems we have with poverty. So first, what is poverty? Well, just when you look up the definition in the dictionary, you might get something like a lack of basic needs, not having enough resources in order to survive or thrive. Why should we care? Well, of course we should care about poverty because if we have some people who are billionaires and then right next to them there are some people who are starving to death, that doesn't seem right. It violates our sense of human dignity and other reasons we should care is there are some studies out there that have shown that the more income inequality that there is in a country, it does seem to be related to having lower economic growth as well as higher chances for revolutions and political instability and things like that. But in an economics class, we really need to understand how poverty is measured in the United States in addition to how can it be measured in other countries. Now, there are two primary ways that poverty is defined and measured in different countries. Now, one way is to define it as a relative measure, as Germany does. A relative measure means we're going to say that a person, or more generally, usually this is defined at the household level. If a household has an income, that is below some measure that's compared to, say, the average of all households or compared to the median amount of all households. And that's how it's done in Germany. In Germany, typically they'll talk about a household being in severe poverty if the household's income is below 40% of the average income for a household of that size or mild poverty if a household's income is below 60% of the average of a household that size. Now, this is an interesting way of doing it. Doing a relative poverty measure means that unless all households of a given size earn the same amount, there are always going to be some households in poverty. Even if the average household earns a lot of money in a country, there will still definitely be some households that earn 40% or 60% of that average. So it's going to be more or less impossible to get rid of poverty if you use a relative poverty measure like this. Now in the United States, we use an absolute measure of poverty. An absolute measure of poverty means we calculate some amount of money that a household needs to have based on its size. And if the household has less than that amount of money, it is in poverty. If it has more than that amount of money, it's not in poverty. So when you come up with an absolute measure, you're calculating a number of dollars or euros that a family needs to have to meet its needs. So when you come up with an absolute measure, you have to understand how was it calculated? How did we arrive at this number? So let's talk about the origin story for the poverty measure in the United States. So in the United States, back in the 1950s, an economist named Molly Orshansky, let's look at Molly. Here's a picture of Molly here. She worked for the Social Security Administration in the United States. Now, the Social Security Administration is in charge of the Social Security program, which its main function is to handle retirement payments to older people. So Molly was given the task of trying to figure out a way to define who's in poverty and who's not in poverty. So what she did was she read some economic research using some expenditure diaries. An expenditure diary is when you get people to record how much they spend on different things for a week or a month or a whole year. And from these kinds of diary studies, she knew that on average in the United States at that time, lower to moderate income families spent about a third of their income on food. So that was fact number one. Lower to moderate income families spend about a third of their income on food. And this was back in 1955, although she was developing these measures a little bit later than that. So then she set out to figure out, well, how much does a family spend on food? If they spend a third of their income on food, how much is that? And then we can kind of figure out what the total income a lower income household might need to satisfy all of their other bills that they need to pay. 
So what she did is she contacted the United States Department of Agriculture. They had something back then called an economy food plan. And an economy food plan was some food that was supposed to be both nutritious and tasty that a lower income family could buy this food, prepare it, and meet all of the nutritional requirements that a family of a certain size would have. It wouldn't be such terrible food that they wouldn't want to eat it. So this economy food plan was created by a combination of agricultural scientists and dietitians who could help develop this meal plan. So let's look at what a meal plan like this might look like. This is an example of one of these thrifty, low cost yet healthy meal plans might look like from the United States Department of Agriculture. This is a much later version. This is from May 2000, but we imagine that they had a similar kind of thing back in the 1950s and 1960s. And so this is an example menu for a family of four where they suggest for each day of the week what you could eat for breakfast and lunch, and they have a menu for dinner as well. So you can look at these items that they're suggesting might be low cost, tasty, and meet nutritional requirements of a family. Even though this is a more modern version, we kind of get the idea of the kind of thing that Molly was using as a basis for her study. So once Molly Orshansky figured out how much a family could spend for low cost yet nutritious food, she calculated that amount and then she multiplied it by three to start developing some kind of income level that she could use as a guideline to figure out below what kinds of incomes might we say that people are living in poverty. Since then, we basically adjust these numbers for inflation. So ever since she came out with her numbers in around 1960 or 1961 was when she completed this work, we've just adjusted it for the cost of inflation over the years. In 2017, this is what the numbers look like, so you can get a feel for it. If a household only has one person in it, then the poverty level income is 12,260. Sometimes we call this the poverty threshold. Because if you're at that number or beyond it, you're not in poverty. If you're below it, everyone in the household is determined to be in poverty. Now, this is for a household size of one. If you add one more person to a household of two, the number is $16,240. After that, basically what the table does is for each additional person that you add in a household, the table adds $4,180 US dollars that that household will need an additional money to buy the food and clothing and other basic needs. So whether we agree with these numbers or not, it's important to understand where they come from when we're determining who is in poverty and who is not in poverty. So also for your information, in 2013 in the United States, the official poverty rate was 14.5%. By 2016, it had gone down to 13.5%. It's still declining after the recession of around 2007, 2008. But what are some problems with how this is measured? Well, number one, the way we measure poverty is based on cash, money, income. And this ignores a lot of non-monetary, sometimes we'll call these in-kind benefits that people receive. For example, a non-cash benefit that is very common in the United States would be something like food stamps, where it's not cash, but you get a card that you can take to the grocery store and use it to buy food with. Since it's not cash, it's not counted as part of these income numbers that we're looking at here. And so a family might have very, very close to these numbers when it comes to cash income. But then if they get these extra benefits, that kind of technically should bring them out of poverty. But the way we measure it does not account for this. Also, the way we measure poverty ignores taxes. So it ignores the fact that some people may earn money and then have taxes removed. It also ignores the fact that there are some tax credits, like the child tax credit. For each child that lives in a household, you get a refundable tax credit, 
where even if you don't earn enough money to owe that amount in taxes, you can get that money back, kind of as a, a rebate for taxes you didn't pay. Similarly, there's an earned income tax credit that could add to the income coming into a household, but it's not counted in the figures that we see in the table up here. Let's look at how common these other benefits are. So these are some results from a study done by Robert Moffat in 2014. The paper is titled Multiple Program Participation and SNAP. Now SNAP stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's another non-monetary program. It's, it's basically what we call food stamps these days. And for people who are on this Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, about 38% of them were also, this is in 2010, getting the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is like a negative income tax. When you earn a dollar, the government will kick in, say, 10 cents additional. The Child Tax Credit I mentioned before, 31% of those households who get the food stamps also get the Child Tax Credit. SSI, Supplemental Security Income, this is largely for disabled people, I believe, people with some kind of disability, 23%. Housing subsidies, not counted when we calculate those limits for who's in poverty, 23%. Women, infant, and children is another nutrition program for pregnant mothers and mothers with small children. Social Security Disability Income, 15%. OASDI, this is retirement program, what we used to just call Social Security. Temporary Assistance for Needy Families is a cash program. And so this and the SSDI and the OASDI, these are probably all things, including maybe the uh, SSI, uh, all these things might be counted in the cash payments, but these other things are likely not to be. Uh, another thing that might be counted, I'm not certain, is unemployment insurance benefits here, but those are less common for these people that Robert Moffat was studying who were on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Eligibility for a lot of these benefits is tied to whether you're in poverty or not, or at least how close you are to the poverty line. So here are some other programs that are tied to that income the same way that it's calculated to see which households are in poverty. That Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program is for any family below 130% of the poverty line. Medicaid, free health care for the poor, is for any family below 138%. This is the Affordable Care Act, which required everyone to have health insurance in the United States or pay a penalty. There are subsidies that will pay for a large percentage of your health insurance, but that percentage is determined by your income. And if you earn too much to get the Medicaid, but up to 400% of the poverty level, the federal government will pay for some of your health insurance. In North Carolina, the state in the United States where I live, free price or reduced price school lunch and breakfasts are also 130% and 180% of the poverty level. So a lot of additional help for poor people in the United States that is not counted in the measure of whether a household is actually in poverty or not. So several economists have done studies adjusting for these kinds of benefits and tax credits. And when you add the value of these other benefits into these income levels, some authors have found that the poverty rate might not be as high as it appears if you account for some of these other benefits that do increase the standard of living of these households, things don't look quite as bad as they would if you ignore them. Another problem with the way we measure income inequality is that it ignores wealth, and this is a big one for me. Wealth is a pool or a stock of money. If you picture a bathtub, then there's money flowing into the bathtub, right? That's your income. Sorry for my terrible art here. So that's your income. That's the money flowing in to the bathtub. It's a stream or a flow of money. But wealth is how much money has piled up in the bathtub, right? So you might have a drain in the bathtub. And the bigger that drain is, the faster water is flowing out as you spend more money. 
But if you have uh, more income coming in than you have money going out, then you're going to build up wealth. So it is possible that there's a household that has a lot of wealth. They might own several houses, boats, cars, a lot of property, have a lot of money in the bank. And yet, because their income falls below these poverty limits that we've been talking about, that household could be defined to be in poverty. But these are people we probably shouldn't be worried about. So that's one factor. Another thing is that these income limits ignore where you live. Now, we do have a separate table for people who live in Alaska and Hawaii, those two states only. But this totally ignores the fact that if you live in New York City, especially in Manhattan, but there are other places, basically anywhere in New York City is going to be very expensive to live, it's going to cost you at least twice as much to live in New York City as just about anywhere else in the United States, except perhaps for San Francisco and some other places in California. So if we have these income numbers and we ignore the fact that they can buy much more in some places than others, I think that's a problem with how we define who is in poverty and who's not. It's just as important what you can buy with your money as how much money you have coming in. A third problem we might be able to point out with how we define poverty is that today's families spend a lot less of their incomes on food, only about 10% on average. So should we increase these poverty limits? Because remember what Molly Orshansky did is she multiplied these numbers by three because families spent a third of their income on food. Well, if the typical family today spends a tenth of their income on food, doesn't it follow that we should multiply the cost of food by something more than three? Here's a table showing from 1960 until 2014 the percent of average household income spent on food. We see back when we get into 1960, the average household was about 16 to 18, maybe about 17 percent, which is why I'm led to believe that when Molly Orshansky got her 33 percent figure that she used, that she must not have been looking at average households. She must have been looking at, say, lower income households when she came up with that figure. But we see today that it's much, much, much closer to around 10 percent of total income spent for food for an average family, whereas much higher than that back in the 1960s and 1970s. By the way, this observation that as people in an economy get more and more income, the percentage of their budget spent on food goes down is called Engel's Law, named after the economist Engel, who first observed this. Another problem with measuring poverty the way we do is we ignore why people are poor. Some people are poor who are retired. They have a low income, right? So it's not really poor, it's a low income because you could be wealthy. So you may be retired, you've paid off your house, you've paid off your cars, you don't need to make money, and you may not be collecting your retirement benefits by choice. And you're household is going to be counted as in poverty. Almost all students are going to be counted in poverty because they live in a household, maybe a dorm room, that has low income. I'm not sure that these are really the groups, retired people and students, that we should be concerned about, really, when we're talking about people living in poverty. Another thing that I'm concerned about is that we don't do a good enough job. There has been some work done on this, but we don't do a good enough job tracking who's in poverty and how long they're in poverty. I'm much more understanding of a situation where someone loses their job and their income goes down for a year, and then the next year they bounce right back. I can understand that. I don't lose sleep over people like that. It's, it's, it's sad, and it can cause some disruptions, but I'm much, much more concerned with people who are born in poverty. Their grandparents were born in poverty. Their parents, they are born and will die in poverty. There are some towns and some counties in the United States that we call persistent poverty regions where there are not opportunities to get education. There are not good opportunities for jobs. And people in these regions have been in poverty, of uh, say, 50% of the population for year after year after decade after decade. This is what I'm concerned with. 
I'm much less concerned with a child who is born into poverty, but they're given great opportunities through their life. And by the time they're in their 20s, they're not in poverty anymore. And so this idea is called income mobility. Income mobility is the idea that over their lifetimes, most people in the United States, at least, move up and down from one income quintile to another. So even if you're born poor, most people who are born poor do not stay poor for their whole lives. Your income goes up as you get into your prime earning years, 30, 40, 50 years old, and then as you retire, your income drops back down and you normally will drop down into a lower income quintile then. Another thing I bring up often, and not because I have anything against immigration, it's just, well, immigration is going to have an impact on poverty statistics. So if you look at a country and the poverty is increasing, the first thought most people have is, wow, the people who live in this country are getting worse off. But a second possibility is that new people are moving into the country, and that's what's increasing the poverty rate. Looking at Germany here, this is a, from an article on DW.com. Their title of their article was German Poverty Rising Despite Economic Growth. And if we look at this graph here, sure enough, I mean, GDP is going up, and at the same time we see the poverty rate has been going up since about 2006. Why is this? Well, I think one reason is that Germany has had fairly open borders, allowing in a lot of people from other Eurozone countries. And Germany has had a very healthy economy with a lot of jobs. And as people move into Germany who may not be familiar with the system of getting jobs, may not speak German, their income earning opportunities are going to be much lower. And so in this article, they actually mention this. So charities are calling for more income redistribution, where we take money from the rich and give it to the poor. Economists are saying that immigration is probably also playing a factor here. So it's just something to keep in mind when you see trends in poverty in a country from over time. Ask yourself how much of it is immigration versus how much of it is a change in status of the people who have been living in the country. Now, we should definitely be concerned with immigrants who come in and are in poverty, and we should help them, but it helps us understand the reason for these changes. Now, in the United States, since that's where I am, let's look at who is most likely and least likely to be in poverty in the United States. Let's look at some graphs to help us understand this. Here are some graphs that I got from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin. And here is a graph on race and poverty status. And we see that in the United States, people that are more likely to be in poverty in 2015 are blacks and Hispanics. Interesting to see that the poverty rate is much, much higher, above that 13 or 14 percent in the general population for these groups. Also interesting to see, though, that the poverty rate for blacks decreased quite dramatically in the 1960s here, from between 50 and 60 percent down to 24 percent today. Looks like there's still some progress to be made. Lowest chance of being in poverty, white people, non-Hispanic whites, and also Asians down here at the lower part of the graph. Looking at gender here, women are the red line on the top here and men on the blue line on the bottom. So women typically have a much higher chance of being in poverty. One of the biggest reasons I think is because a lot of women are raising children alone, meaning they have more people in the household and those children they're raising are not gonna be bringing in money into the household typically. And so they're gonna have a higher chance of being in poverty. What about type of household here? If you look at those families I was just discussing, families led by a female householder in 2014 and 2015 here, very high poverty rates compared to the overall poverty rate, about double. Male householder, a man in a similar kind of situation, much less likely to be in poverty. Married couple families, if you don't want to be in poverty, that looks like the place to be you're usually going to have at least the opportunity to have a couple of income earners. That is going to dramatically decrease your chances of living in poverty. 
let's look at where you live. So what kind of place do you live in? If you live in a suburban area that's near a city but not in a city, you have much lower poverty rate. Highest poverty rates are going to be in inner city areas and in very small rural town areas that aren't near a large city that's kind of an engine for jobs and growth. Another thing to look at about where you live is in the United States in the south where I live, much higher chance of being in poverty here than if you live in the northeast or the midwest. However, one thing to keep in mind is that it's much cheaper to live in most areas of the south and so since we don't adjust these poverty income limits for the cost of living, it might not be quite as bad as all that living in the South. Lastly, here's a graph on poverty rates by age from 1959 through 2013. And we see that even though it used to be the case that people age 65 and older had higher poverty rates, if you follow this line down, 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 down to today, the age group that is least likely to be in poverty these days are those who are 65 and older. People who are under age 18, children, are the most likely group to be in poverty by age. So now that we understand how poverty is calculated and who is more or less likely to be in poverty, what are some things we might be able to do about people in poverty? And also, what are some things we could do to help reduce the amount of income inequality? There are two types of government programs, and it's important that you understand the difference between these. Public assistance is a kind of program where we help you because you need help. So we're going to give you money or we're going to give you housing assistance because you're poor and because you need it. That's a different kind of rationale from social insurance programs. A social insurance program means that you paid into it. And because you paid into this insurance program, if you need help, we're going to help you out. In the United States, the common public assistance programs are SSI, that Supplemental Security Income I was talking about, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, which is mostly for women raising children alone, women, infant, and children, food assistance, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, food assistance, the health care for poor people, and the Earned Income Tax Credit, these are all things that you don't have to qualify for by having paid into. You just get them because you need them. You have to qualify in that way. Another idea that has been kicked around for a long time, but it is getting some traction these days, is an idea of a UBI, or a universal basic income. A universal basic income is a program where every person in a country now, it depends on who's discussing it, but typically it would be every baby, every teenager, every middle-aged person, every old person. Everyone in a country would get a check for a certain amount of money, perhaps $20,000 or perhaps $30,000. The details is where it's going to get interesting if a country decides to pass one of these. A universal basic income is normally proposed to replace all these other things, get rid of the welfare programs and the food benefits and the housing subsidies and all that kind of stuff and replace them with one program. One of the arguments is that this is simpler than having to go to apply for all these different programs and there are all these different departments of government that run these different programs. So it would be more efficient. Just mail everyone, no matter who they are, a check for $20,000 or $30,000. It would be much simpler. There would be no paperwork involved you just get the money. Another benefit would be that people could use the money for whatever they wanted to. They could use the money to go to college. They could use the money to start a business. They could use the money to sit on their couch and watch TV. If that's what they wanted to do and that's what made them happiest, okay, I guess let them do it. The big worry, the big reservation behind doing a universal basic income is that we don't want to make this so much money that it's a disincentive to work. So if you paid people enough money to where they could live relatively comfortably without having to work, then where's the money going to come from, right? In order to have the money to have a universal basic income, people are going to have to work and pay taxes so that the government has the money to pay this UBI. 
But if another 10, 20, 30, or 100 million people in a country stop working because of this benefit, then you're going to have serious problems on your hand. So it's an interesting idea. And people on both the left and the right are seriously considering this idea as it has some attractive things about it. But it also could be very dangerous if it has these disincentive factors. The most common social insurance programs where you have to pay into them in order to get benefits in the United States are Social Security, retirement program. You have to pay into it a certain number of years to get benefits out. Medicare, health care for old people. You have to pay in in order to get benefits. And unemployment insurance. When you lose your job, if you get laid off by a company, you only get unemployment benefits if you worked long enough to qualify to get the unemployment benefits to begin with. Now, other ideas in order to reduce income inequality and help alleviate poverty would be a progressive income tax, which simply means that you're going to tax higher incomes at a higher rate. If people with very high incomes have to pay a larger percentage of their income in tax, that will reduce income inequality. And then perhaps you can use some of that money to help pay for some of these poverty programs or perhaps the universal basic income. A tax on your assets when you die, called an estate tax or sometimes lovingly referred to as a death tax in the United States, is a way to reduce income inequality because if you have a lot of wealth, some families build up wealth over many generations, if you have a lot of wealth it's easy to make a high income by investing that wealth in income producing assets. So there is an argument by some saying that to make things more fair, when people die, take most of that money instead of allowing it to be transferred to the younger generations. And then you can use that money for other income equalizing programs. The complaint is that this is a disincentive for people to work hard to earn money, and well, you pay taxes on it once when you earn it, then if you save that money, if you want to save that money to leave it for your heirs instead of spending it all, well, this is a disincentive. This, this kind of gives you the incentive to just spend all that money before you die or not save it to begin with. So that's one of the complicated parts of having an estate tax or a death tax. You can also have things like housing subsidies, as, as we've mentioned. I uh, think the best thing to me, since I am an educator, is to have a free or low cost and high quality education. Many studies have suggested that this is the best ticket out for people who are born into poverty, is to give them a wonderful world-class education, teach them what the opportunities are, give them the skills to go out there and do anything they want, and the means with which to go out there and succeed probably one of the best anti-poverty measures that a government could engage in. Not just giving an education for free, but a high quality education for free. And additionally, we do want to combat discrimination wherever we see it. We don't want anyone to be held back from living up to their fullest potential just because they're a minority or they're female now, a trade-off that we have to talk about here that economists always bring up is this tension between equality and efficiency. The more equal you force incomes to be, or the more ready you are to take money away from someone who has worked hard to earn it, the less likely someone is to work hard to earn it. So if we were to force incomes to be equal between everyone, Who's going to be the one that does the hard job, the dangerous job, the job that requires many years of education? The more you try to make things equal, the less efficiency there's going to be. Efficiency here in the sense of we're not going to be able to produce as much as we can as a nation. So it's great to want to redistribute the pie that we have in a nation to make things more fair, to make things more equal. But if what you do to make things more fair also reduces the size of the pie, which is an extremely common thing to happen, you have to be careful. You have to know the choice you're making. How much are we going to reduce the total amount we have by taking these actions to split what we have more equally? Now, that's related to, but a little bit of a separate issue 
from the idea of fairness or equity, as I think about it anyway. Instead of trying to make the results equal, and try, instead of trying to make the incomes of everyone equal, I think it's much more important to make sure there's equality of opportunity, equality of education, and equality in the sense that there's no discrimination. Make the rules fair and enforce those rules. But if some people decide that they want to make more than others, that they want to work hard, if they want to save their money, I don't really see a great excuse for saying that we should harm those people or take the things from them that they worked so hard to build. Very brief political discussion because I'm very apolitical here. I don't like politics, but to make a complete discussion about this, we can't ignore the common, at least historical trends that in the United States, Democrats are usually the ones that are pushing a little bit more for a quality of outcomes, a little more likely historically to be for helping the poor, giving things to the poor. Whereas Republicans are a little bit more on the supply side, we might say, a little bit more for trying to make sure that the rules are fair and trying to make sure that the economy as a whole is robust and that businesses are not being limited by government rules or taxes so that they can hire as many people as possible. Libertarians, another kind of a third smaller party in the United States, in general, they're for limited government, and some take this to an extreme. But I would say overall, libertarians are also for fairness under the rules, for government hands-off, a laissez-faire kind of approach, where you want to have the incentive for people to work and take care of themselves to a much larger degree than either Republicans or Democrats would typically believe. Now, there's one other thing I want to bring up before I end this video, and that is world poverty. I've spent most of this video focusing on the United States and how we measure poverty and what percentage of people in the United States are in poverty. Let's look at the world in general and how we think about poverty there. Here's a map that I got off of Wikipedia. The citation and credit for this map is up at the top here. And so thank you to Canuck Guy, the person who made this map, where typically in the world, instead of talking about people earning thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, otherwise they're in poverty per year, when we look worldwide, typically we use a much more modest standard when we talk about poverty, $1.25 US per day. Multiply that for the whole year, you're talking somewhere on the order of $500 a year. How many people have to live on less than that? Well, of course, if we're talking about the United States or Canada, it's going to be very, very low. And in most of Europe and Russia, it's also going to be very low, similarly with Australia. But you need to understand that there is a large percentage of people in Brazil and China and India and Africa. Madagascar is a country that we make funny cartoons about with little animals. It doesn't look like it's such a wonderful place to live when 61 to 80 percent of the people there live on less than a dollar 25 per day. Similar with many of these other countries in Africa and in Asia. So this is what I truly want you to think about when you think about poverty. Yes, in the United States, some people live in poverty, some people have it hard, but when the poorest people in the United States are much, much, much better off than the average person living in many of these other countries, I think it kind of puts things in perspective. That doesn't mean we should care less about the people in our own country, but perhaps we should care a little bit more about those in other countries who are suffering extreme, extreme forms of poverty. And that's it for this video, guys. So if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Otherwise, I wish you the best of luck in all your studies. This is Mark Berkey signing out.